not affected by the global semiconductor shortage, fragments of silicon. Welcome to another installment of Fragments of Silicon. Um, I'm not getting any feedback here, am I? Like, no, it was never on stuff that you said. It was like coming from from your speakers when other people were talking, but it doesn't seem to be happening now. All right, that, uh, good, good. I don't want people dri being driven insane by the broadcast. Uh, They'll be driven insane for other reasons. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> anyway, welcome to another... Um, it's going into Fragments of Silicon. I'm your host, Adam. Joining me as always, the regular crew. Let's get to the news. All right, Petty, you're starting off because, um, you know, your news affected uh, the scheduling this week. All right, yeah. I was supposed to have a doctor's appointment today for a um, injection of some pain medicine into my back. And as we were getting in the car, the doctor's office just called me and said, they had to reschedule because the doctor had a family emergency. So that's been rescheduled to Friday, and that means we had to bump our guess we were going to have, our show we were going to have Friday to next week. So sorry about that. Things got sorted out, so it's no big deal. Indeed. As, as far as other gaming related news, um, not a whole lot. Watch the um, Final Fantasy XIV fan fest thing, and really hyped for Endwalker. I I might have pre-ordered the collector's edition, for with shipping comes to about two hundred twenty something dollars. Oh Jesus! <laughs> so yeah, that's that's gonna be fun. And yeah, just been kind of playing games, testing out my new computer with as many different games on Game Pass as I can. So far, nothing horrible is broken. <laughs> this is good. Like, uh, and uh, anything else? Uh, I beat Sunset Overdrive over the week, so that's that was all right. And yeah, I think that's about it. Quiet week overall. All right. All right. Uh, Mac, what's going on with you? You had an animators meeting just before the show started? Uh, yes, we're trying to recruit a new animator. There's not much to say on that front. Apparently, it went really quick. <laughs> um, right. Kira and I started the review for Fun Bag Fantasy 3 If. <laughs> I say started because the non-interactive opening sequence is two hours and still running. <laughs> uh, that does not surprise me. Like, yeah, we haven't gotten to the opening credits. We haven't even gotten to the... We finally, finally, at one hour, 56 minutes into the game, got something that vaguely resembled a revelation of the plot. <laughs> That's good. Every time we cut scenes, we were like, oh, look, it's another set of new and possibly irrelevant characters. <laughs> now, I, I, I will preface this by saying I have played some visual novel games. Mm -hmm. um, not a ton. I did play one that had a rather extensive opening sequence. Um, but nothing in the two hour to three hour range. So we're gonna have to split this into multiple videos. That's 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 the bottom line. Without getting too specific on the details, given the purview of this show. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, I that, mean, some good. visual novels just are just novels that are visual. There are no I, choices or anything. I think that's the case with this one. Just no, it's, I, it's I, known I've, to happen. 
I've done some research online and it's yeah, it I don't know. <laughs> there seems to be some interactivity to it. I, I would I would hope that there's some kind of interactivity to it. But yeah, two two hours two hours in and barely any nitty or gritty. <laughs> so we we put it on pause because yeah, we we don't we don't know where the logical stopping point is. <laughs> I've, now, done some I don't, on, I've done some I don't play visual online. novels, right? What's that? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Oh, I was just I was just going to sum up by saying um, <sighs> I've done some research online, and um, the series in general does have some interactivity to it, but it takes a long time to get to it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we couldn't do a proper review on it because we weren't sure. Like I said, where to pause. The previous game had a uh opening and credit sequence that uh gave us a sort of demarcation point. And so yeah. So we're just sitting back making hilarious commentary about everything that's going on for the moment. But yeah, we're gonna split it into another episode and dive another two hours into it and see what happens. Uh yeah. and then we'll give a proper and then we'll give a proper summation on that. Other than that, um, I'm working my ass off on Rideshare trying to uh, beat the Reaper on my finances. Not much else to say studio-wise. Uh, still charging inexorably towards partner. And I learned something about mm -hmm. that. Once you're affiliated, uh, raids and non-organic friend views don't count hmm. towards your average viewers. Yep. <laughs> so go Twitch. Thanks for making a very popular feature useless. Oh, I got a friend who's got like a hundred thousand followers and they just raided me with fifteen hundred and I get nothing. <laughs> Unless they like refresh to be there naturally or whatever. They have to actually remove the raid referral from the URL. And uh, the person who rated you would have to be kind. If they wanted to be kind, they could actually create a function that they would have to do every time. So that way, when it refers everybody, it auto refreshes their browser for them. But this is I'm a lot of. I'm huh? sure there's a story behind this. Yeah, I'm sure there's something. It's obvious. I'm guessing it's a, you know, don't pay your friends to raid you the kind of thing. <laughs> Uh, uh abuse prevention but yeah so I, that's that's a fun thing so now i'm guessing I'm a, it's a good consistency thing hey like they probably want to make sure you're consistently getting those 1500 followers or something yeah the well because partner is a is a whole other deal obviously it's a whole other financial tier and <sighs> the idea behind partners is is that you get corporate sponsorship from twitch and they you know give you deep discounts on going to TwitchCon and there's uh the whole esports section and so on and so forth. Less than 10% of the overall creators on Twitch ever make partner. So they mm -hmm. they want organic growth because they want their partners to actually be a draw for new people rather than simply rehashing the same old people over. So honestly at this point you probably have you, you almost have a better chance trying to find a new streaming service and hoping the new stream and like getting good on that new streaming service and hoping that new streaming service makes it big than trying to actually get big on an existing streaming service. Funny you <laughs> should say that. I am now a level up uh, gamer on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> Funny uh, you should say that. Almost like so we anyway, had planned segues or something. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I, anyway. I prefer Peloton myself. <laughs> anyway, I don't know. Segway can at least get you somewhere. <laughs> that's I mean, not, not that's debatable. Walking, but all right, that's, yeah. that's debatable. Anyway, all right. that's all I got for this week. All right, Twilight, you go. All right. Well, um, yeah, there's not really much to say about this week. Uh, well, besides, um, at uh, starting tomorrow at work, we if we bring our um, vaccination cards in, we're free to. No longer wear our masks at work. I'm not really sure how to feel about that, though. Uh, maybe I'm, a good... 
Hmm? We'll probably get into into that on the political show. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, that's a whole thing that's happening. You know, yeah. So, you know, we'll definitely have more to say about that, but... You know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm going to say that for later. Um, yeah, the... <clears throat> besides that, it's been getting warmer over here, of course. Or, I'm going to miss the cooler days from April the, until now. But, yeah. There's that, and... Uh, yeah, they've been doing some uh, yard work around here that the uh, uh, for the landlady, um, some weeding and such. It's something I've been consistently doing so far. Um, uh, they're mostly involving weed killer though, and then um, yeah, the um, gaming wise, um, still doing the uh, Monday collaboration with Mac and uh, Kira, and um, uh, that was actually. A, Went pretty well <laughs> Monday for the most part. Yeah, we actually we actually won some. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's teams of what, five or six? Uh Overwatch's teams of six. So yeah, mm. it's you three and then like three other people that are random or whatever. That's right. Tippy over mm. here is running over here giving me the look like he's ready for a six V six himself. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, yeah but as I said. Play some on the, the game I got for this Sunday, and yeah, that's it for me. All right. Uh, well, golly, it's your go. Uh, not a hell of a lot in this end of the woods. Um, mm. I had the day off for a doctor's appointment yesterday just because it was an awkward time for the appointment was when they scheduled me. Uh, it was like at middle of the afternoon, so there wasn't enough time to go in beforehand and then go in afterwards. It would have been like, anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, that was nice. I was able to get some stuff around, uh, done around the house. In addition to that, uh, not a whole lot exciting video game wise, still been playing MS saga on Sundays with, Mac has been going well. Otherwise, um, not too much, I don't think. All right. I'm trying, to, trying to think if there have been any particular new games aside from um, the one that we're reviewing this weekend, and I don't have much to say about that one yet. So. All right. Well, I mean, if you don't have much to say, you don't have much to say. Sorry. So yeah, I. Um, anyway. Less, it, it is also getting warmer here, and I'm needing to. I'm debating when I'm going to try to put in my air conditioner, probably within the next couple of weeks. Okay. Um, well, I guess that if there's nothing else, it's my turn. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, I suppose the big news, my end of the woods, is uh, last Friday I picked up my new glasses. And, yeah, I can literally see the difference. Like, the world is a lot sharper and less blurry. You know, minus a few days, uh, you know, with that whole adjustment period, mm -hmm. which is always fun and headache inducing. But, you know, my eyes seem to be, you know, adjusted, thankfully. Um, uh, let's see. Yes, in terms of games, uh, playing Bioshock Remastered. I, I don't know. I, I, my computer's having some sort of issue with it, as in, uh, if you're familiar with Unreal Pop-In, like, I mean, it, it's there, but it's a lot more pronounced, like, textures aren't fully loading in, and I'm not sure what it is. Like, uh, keep in mind that, you know, we are talking about Unreal 2.5. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not, a, Bioshock's not Unreal 3, like some people think. But, um, I know it's remastered, but it's still an old game, so old games have um problems on newer systems yeah the texture pop-in is actually an undocumented splicer power uh, yeah and yes this does mean that this the scenery is also all splicers yeah <laughs> always has been. 
<laughs> the power of texture streamer buffering. Yes. Um, but anyway, uh, that's about it for my news this week. So merrily we shall roll along to the interview portion of the broadcast. And joining us uh, this week is Evan Finch. Or is it Evan? Yeah, Evan, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, Evan Fitch of uh, Fly Pig Games. Hi, thank you for having me. Very grateful, you guys. It's uh, it's been really great here listening to you guys. Oh, What's no going problem. on? I'm like, uh, not much aside from the stuff we just covered. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> so how we like to get started formally is we like to get to know the people or person uh, behind the game, the studio, and all that stuff. And we do this by asking this particular question. What got you interested in video games, both in the uh, personal and a professional sense? Ah, so first, I mean, I've been playing video games since I was, I don't know, like two or three. Uh, first console we had was a Genesis, Sega Genesis. I think first ever game I ever played was Sonic 2. Uh, so, I mean, for me, it's always been like my big escape, you know, if anything's going on in my world, whatever it is. Video games for me is just like a lot of people. It's, it's my vice. It's where I get my escapism from. Um, so for me, a personal level, I've been doing it since I was a child. I'm 31 now, so, you know, 28, 29 years. Um, so for me, it's just a part of my everyday life. I'm sure it's probably everybody listening and probably you guys, it's a huge part of my life. Um, on the professional side, I actually have like a, a bit of a weird journey getting to being a game dev. Um, I, uh, was actually used to be a truck driver. I was a heavy machine hauler. So I hauled around tractors and whatnot on my trailer. Uh, so exactly one day related I, industry. Yeah. So I had, uh, I've, I've been doing game development as a hobby for like 20 years, just using RPG Maker uh, for a very long time. And um, just kind of, you know, that gives you a great overview on how, how programming somewhat works and how to structure codes and, and whatnot. Um, but I, I knew kind of the time that like commercially, I don't know how, like how viable it was to push kind of like, you know, into the big leagues with, with some of the other games. Um, so I had an accident at work, uh, about eight months ago. Um, I was loading a machine up onto my trailer and, uh, long story short on that one, the brakes are supposed to lock. And so the, the tractor doesn't come rolling back down on you. Um, well, I, uh, had the brakes locked and I went to go put a chain on it to make sure that it doesn't come rolling back down on me. And uh, when I went to go put the chain on, the brakes failed. It's kind of like your worst case scenario in those, you know, like the very worst case scenario. Um, so I was holding on to a control box because we don't actually go in the tractors to drive them up and down. Uh, it's, that's even more, I'd probably be dead if that was the case. Um, so when the brakes release, it just, it's so heavy, it just goes straight off the side of your trailer. Um, and because I was holding this control box, it whipped me off with it. And it, uh, it just pretty much ruined my leg. Uh, my right leg. Uh, so I'll, you know, I'll never really walk again correctly. And I'll, I'll always have to live with this disability. Um, so, you know, funny enough at the time, truck driving was, is, was my dream. And, you know, it's kind of a funny dream for someone to have, but, you know, my dad was a truck driver and, you know, always saw him as, you know, the man and he was my hero. And, and so for me, um, I had a very deep connection with truck driving. And so this was with my dream to do this. Um, I come from a sales background before I became a truck driver. And, uh, so I broke my leg and it was pretty bad and horrific. And um, so I didn't know what I was going to do after that. Uh, so I laid there for about a month and a half in like more pain than I can really explain to you. Um, like you, you can't eat and you can't sleep. And like there's no amount of morphine that takes the pain away at all. And there's no one that really can really help you. And like, you know, a lot of people really care in the first week that you're injured and disabled now and a lot of people care about that in the first week but like after that no one really cares anymore and not that they don't care because they're just too busy to even really be checking in on you all the time and you know so when i was laying there like so alone and and you know just in pain constantly and, and it just felt endless like my dog was always there for me uh she would just lay there it didn't matter if it was the middle of the night it didn't matter if it was if i was waking her up it didn't really matter she just laid there with her head on my on my leg and just kind of staring at me so the way I looked at in, in through all that time is, you know, like she was like a big hero to me and, and like really saved me through a lot of that stuff. So I, uh, I knew I needed to do something else 
And the only really other talent I had or skill was making games. So I decided to start up Fly Peak Games and I decided to go all in, you know, not just as a hobby or not just as a little thing. So I registered as a business, registered the studio, um, and then I dove into Unreal and learned how to use it, um, learned how to make online games. Um, and I created Hero Tales because I wanted to make uh, a, some kind of game about animal heroes. Um, and I wanted to give, you know, purpose behind it. Um, so we started our Change the World campaign as well. So um, this is kind of my way of, in a funny way of giving back to to how I feel, you know, towards animals is, so we have an early supporter bundle that's available through our website and 25% uh, of all those sales go towards um, like animal rescues and shelters around the world. Oh, I mean, uh, I, I'm not exactly sure where to start with this since, you know, the, the horrific leg injury, but I, I guess the first thing to say is um, sorry for your loss. Uh, so hopefully you are in a lot less pain than you were seven months ago. <laughs> yeah, it's I've I've been in rehab now for for quite a long time, and it's just kind of like kind of getting me better, like to the best that I can get at now. Um, you know, it's not really a baseline anymore. Um, but I'm not in much pain now. It's a lot of store, like a lot of like the stiffness, and you know, certain exercises still give me quite a bit of uh, soreness and whatnot. But uh, but no, I, I appreciate your. Your kind words, yeah. It's uh, it's, it's this kind of a light, you know, a complete a lot of mental things you got to go through is kind of worse than the physical things. Uh, we'll take your word for it. <laughs> like I, 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 you know, it's like I have never had that kind of injury. I'm like, though I do know some people on staff who could probably sympathize on a more personal level. I, Indeed. <laughs> I it mean, um, I, yeah. it's just a mental toll it takes on you because your life changes in in that second. Um, you know everything where you were going has now changed to something else, and you just don't really know what it is. And you know you have to start relying on everybody else because you can't move. Right. I'm like, well, um, well thankfully that you are recovering as much as possible, but. I suppose we should shift a bit further into the actual game development. Right? Yep. And I suppose the first question there is, you know, prior to the accident, did you have any experience uh, making games or, you know, was that died your first foray? No, like I was saying, I, I had done it now for about 20 years as a hobby uh, through RPG Maker. Um, I started back when I was, oh, I don't know, maybe like nine or 10 years old. I first found RPG Maker 95. Uh, and I played some Dragon Ball game fan game that somebody had made in, and it just blew my mind that one person had made this this made this Dragon Ball fan game, and it was a lot of fun to play. And and uh, I found out how they did it in in RPG Maker, and and that kind of started it all. And you know, I I made some pretty funny games back in the day that uh, I don't really mention anymore, but I had like an like an anime dating game that I made that did quite well. It was an old RPG that was kind of like a, a romancing RPG sim game, and um, and that kind of like started me like I had a you know decent success at the time in that niche of what it was, and so that kind of you know I've been chasing that dragon ever since that that you know that uh, I don't know that satisfaction of making something that people resonated in some way. Um, so uh, I've been doing it for twenty years. It's kind of like my my artistic art form. So uh, now has been the first time I've been doing it in like a three D engine, like Unreal, um, and first time doing doing online as well. So it's it's been a it's a completely different level than what RPG Maker offers. And, and that's to be expected, I think. Uh, you know, given that you know it's nothing against RPG Maker, but you know, Unreal is a much more um, elaborate tool set. Yeah, RPG Maker is sort of intentionally limited. Like, don't get me wrong, you can stretch it a lot if you're good. But that doesn't not necessarily worth it compared to the gains of just using a tool that's designed for you know a wider it, variety of things. Exactly, and I tell a lot of people I think that it's a great starting point. I think that when you get into game development, it's yeah. uh, a great place to understand kind of the flow of coding and kind of how to structure coding. Um, but it's obviously missing a lot of like really core foundational things that you would want in a game engine. Um, 
but it's a great place to tell stories and it's a great place to, to put your foot in the door and how games are made. No doubt. Um, I suppose it depends on what you're shooting for. Um, also true. Yeah. Okay. Um, like for example, uh, what is the premise of hero tales? Like, um, I, I've read on your website that it's a mini RPG meshed with um, hmm. 5v5 uh, PvP elements. <laughs> so if you want to tip into how to get into game development, don't try and create a genre. It takes a lot longer, <laughs> and there aren't a lot of tutorials on how to do it. Um, <laughs> so uh, for me, I am a massive RPG fan, like a massive RPG fan. I... I uh, some of my favorite memories as a kid and, and just some of my some of the strongest emotions I felt I have felt from RPG stories. Um, but I knew that when I when I wanted to create a game, like I wanted to create something that was different. And as a, as any resource will tell you on the Internet about making games, that is a very bad idea uh, to take risks in that in that sense of um, like I had no idea what needed to be in the game. So the idea is, and the simple idea is, is that I want to take the mechanics, the gameplay, the story elements, and turn those into a, a 5v5 PvP. So the challenging part about that is, uh, especially when I ask like the public, you know, what is what means most to you in RPG? One of the number one things that comes back is story. So how do you tell a story when you're aiming for you know 20, 30, maybe max 40 minute matches? How do you tell a, a, con, a connection or how do you tell a connecting story in that time? So our, our kind of answer to this is a random background story element. So when you launch into the match, the server will choose a random background story, which kind of explains you know, kind of why the heroes are there and why the villains are there and why they're fighting each other. Um, and this will change things like the side quests that are available to you and time, time of day and weather and um, different things that are available on the map. Um, the actual gameplay loop of, of Hero Tales uh, is essentially after both, after both teams are um, spawned into the map, the server will choose a chosen one from each side. Uh, that chosen one is more powerful. Um, they have more abilities and certain, uh, like certain quests are only available for them to be able to finish. Um, and the whole idea is, is they're working as a team. The hero team wants to try and protect their chosen one, and the villain team wants to work and protect their um, their chosen one. So the hero's objectives are mainly to complete side quests throughout the game to reach their main objective. So this could be, so for instance, the princess is, is in a castle, and it's, you know, the villains have kidnapped her, um, and now they're trying to stop you from getting her back. So there'll be three side quests that, that, that lead up to that. And you're more quintessential uh, RPG, you know, block pushing, clearing enemies, uh, finding items to fit in this. You know, it's very, we're going for the most, you know, biggest RPG tropes we can find for those things. Um, while they're doing this, they will also encounter, you know, an NPC enemies on the map and, and things like that. Um, they'll be able to level up their abilities. Uh, each, each class has unique abilities. Uh, they're all designed to be balanced and work with each other, um, and be defensive against the other team. Um, so as they're doing these side quests, they'll get experience, they'll level up. Uh, during this time, the villains will either A, have their own side quest to complete, or B, are trying to actively prevent the heroes from completing their side quests. So that's the villain's objective, is to stop the heroes from doing their quest and to kill their chosen one. Okay. If um, the heroes... Sorry? No, no, go on, go on. So if the heroes are able to complete their side quests and the villains haven't successfully stopped them, it goes to the final boss fight. And the final boss fight, the hero, uh, the chosen from each team, We'll go into, uh, we're calling them their beast forms. They're kind of like your chosen forms. If you watch Attack on Titan, it's kind of like your Titan form. Um, they go into these big giant forms, and they have a big fight while their teams are fighting at their feet. And that kind of is like the final fight to determine the winner. And uh, during that big fight, you'll have uh, each team, you know, during the fight will be prompted maybe to do like just very simple little mini games that maybe power up their chosen or um, or the opposite, maybe depower the other chosen one. Uh, it could be like, you know, mashing a button or, you know, maybe go 
collect the six crystals around or whatever you know something something simple uh to keep the to keep the, the battle going hmm. and let's see uh in terms of the story in terms of the lore well what's going on here who are the heroes who are the villains so we have we have a base lore, and what we've actually done is we've had um, quite a few writers reach out and volunteer in, in exchange for obviously being in our credits and and working with us. Um, they're actually we have quite a few writers who are writing some backstories for us. Um, so the way that we've directed them is um, we have kind of uh, like an essential lore, and then everything on top of that they can kind of just build. So. We haven't released a trailer yet. We're probably a week or two releasing because we're going to be releasing the full demo. Um, and with that, we'll be releasing the cinematic trailer with it. Um, the idea that the cinematic trailer kind of explains a bit is that for a very long time, the animal heroes have been going from world to world trying to create a true peace, to try and stop war, to try and stop conflict. Um, the, the ultimate underlying theory behind it is kind of like uh, in Kingdom Hearts, you know how they have different worlds? And each world is kind of independent of each other, but there's still a whole story going on. Um, it's kind of that same idea. And each match is an, a different story that's being told, um, whether it be in a different world or a different universe or however you want to conceive that. Each match is a different story. And the background story mechanic of that is they're explaining why those heroes are on this world or in this time or in this universe at this point. Why have they traveled here? And it could be, again, you know, the villains are there now doing this or, you know, there's this huge conflict here. And so there's we've given them a base, a base lore to work off of where then the background story will kind of choose the very particular details of that. OK, and uh, digging further uh, is each, let's say, individual uh, player here a distinct character or are they a class? So uh, the initially for just the the playtesting and the demo, we have each class is a specific animal. Um, you know, like the lizard is the berserker, and the the lion is the warrior, and we have like the Doge from Dogecoin, like the dog, the the Shiba. Uh, that's the like the hunter that or the the fighter now. It's not no longer the hunter, and he's like a like a Goku character. If you've seen any of the the latest trailer, he he does some pretty super saiyan crap. It's, it's Doge coin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just so we don't get canceled <laughs> <laughs> um yeah. so yeah the doge, our... yeah, the doge is an italian politician yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> just fyi <laughs> okay. so the so the ideas are at first for right now for the fact that i don't have a 3d artist um i don't have time to to just do this where it's you can choose your different animals and whatnot so right now it's it's set in stone um, when the game gets released, because right now it works on a peer-to-peer -peer system, um, it just works for the Steam test servers. Um, when the, the game is released after the demo, we're switching it over to dedicated servers. Um, so then we'll be able to host more things, like your character will be able to be hosted, your, you know, we'll be able to host a shop, we'll be able to do these kinds of things, and make it a lot easier. Otherwise, now it, it pretty much just comes to creating a local save file. Um, and it, 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 for me, it doesn't seem like the it makes sense for the program to be concentrated on that right now. Um, so, the, you know, long the long answer to your question is right now, no, the animals are set to their class. Um, at the end of the at the end of the development, and when the real game's released, it'll be fully customizable. You've got to choose your animal, your gear, your whatever, and then your class will be chosen in game. Okay. And how far along is the game at this point? Uh, in the last week, about twice as far as it was before. <laughs> um, we actually had a funny, a funny point. So, our, like, Hero Tales was my first game in in Unreal and my first online game. So, when I first coded it, I was going through tutorials and and this long course and all this kind of stuff to get it. And I had built a foundation, and the actual foundation of Hero Tales was to be a top down style. It was more to be like a top down MOBA view and, and act more like a MOBA. Um, as I started to grow my Instagram. Um, I guess you guys. I guess you guys call me on Twitter, right? Not Instagram. That's an official you showed Adam. Um, on yeah. Instagram, I started releasing a couple of videos, and we all of a sudden exploded. Like, I'm talking like 1,500 followers a month, like out of nowhere. Like, it just I started releasing my videos and it started going crazy. The problem was is I made I made a mistake. Uh, I made a mistake of making the promo videos cooler than the the game. 
Uh, so that was a that was a huge mistake, and I say it because welcome it was a to my world. <laughs> I say it was a mistake because I took this game that was a simple project for me that I was probably close to being ready to just being done with it and, and releasing it in the state that it was in to it getting really overhyped. A lot of people jumping on board. I got literally, we were talking within a couple of weeks and, and the hype going around, people tell me how cool the battle system was like. And I'm like, I haven't even showed off a battle system. <laughs> and you think it's cool. And it's just from the promo videos. Right. And I made the promo video just to be marketing tools you know i made dance videos first and then that turned into people be like oh the emotes look so cool i'm like those aren't emotes they're just dancing promos but sure now this now it has a emote system <laughs> and you know then i did like this this uh fight this kung fu fight little fight scene one minute fight scene to bangerang and everybody just all of a sudden was all about it the battle system looks so cool i can't wait to check this out at this point it wasn't even it wasn't even 3d it was still top down 2d view you, there's no way you were flipping around like Dragon Ball Z and going to be doing all this stuff. So I went back and literally redid everything. I went from a top down, only having to worry about the X and Y axis uh, to complete 3D third person shooter. I had to learn how to properly use line tracing to get your projectiles going to the center of the screen, which believe it or not, you think is easy, but it's, it's, it's not just two things. It's like 10. Um, and then, then we had to resign everything else because the abilities sucked, the attacks sucked, the PvP wasn't fun, nothing was fun. And I was just so unimpressed, I didn't want to show anybody because I was so unimpressed with it. But I had worked 14, 15, 16 hours a day for so long getting it ready to go. So I took the risk and literally just hit delete on all of it and, and just recoded the way the characters move, the camera positioning, the projectile system and redid every single ability for the heroes. My brother, Mark, he does all the level design on it. Um, so he's been redesigning the level, adding a bunch of new textures. Um, so now we're at a, a point. Again, you'll find that I have long answers for everything. Uh, you'll find that <laughs> I'm at a point now where we're doing playtesting on a small scale. Um, so we're, we're inviting a few streamers at a time um a few of our internal guys a few friends to kind of play so we so we have time to figure out the glitches as they happen and the bugs as they happen um we're at a point now we're probably within a month away from the demo being released we're doing another play test within a week um and then we're going to be uh pretty much polishing everything up and then releasing the demo on vox pop um and so it's at the demo stage and then at that point we're going to be either uh, handing it to publishers or uh, crowdfunding it. So hmm. um, we're in a state now. We're probably within a month away from the full demo being released, and it's you know online. It's it, PvP works. We'll probably have a couple of different game modes in there. I've already programmed the, the TDM mode in there, so you can just go in there and you guys just kill each other if you want. Um, there's the main campaign mode where you can actually play the campaign. I'm gonna, probably going to add a few other ones. Probably add some kind of zombie mission to it. You know, not exactly like skeletons, but you can go through and kill skeletons and stuff with your friends. Um, I mean, you know, a few other little, little kind of things to make the demo a bit more fun. Um, and then after that, probably about six months development time, and then we'll be releasing it. Okay. Like, and, like, are you worried about the upcoming demo, or are you looking forward to it? I am getting extremely excited for it because when i was unhappy with the game i was nervous and really didn't want to show anybody and felt like i was wasting my time to be quite honest and not because i wasn't learning and those kind of things it just felt when i played it and i was like i'm not having any fun no one else can have fun with this um the last play test it was still in a really crappy state and it wasn't in a great state but we all played for four or five hours having fun and laughing and just having a great time um that motivated me so incredibly much to go back on everything and make everything like it's been less than a week and the game's unrecognizable from what it was when we did our, our last play test. We've been putting like 16 hour days in every single day. It's been like crazy, uh, unreal, no pun intended. Um, so nervous. No, I am so excited to show the, a greater audience what we have to offer. I'm feeling uh, confident and excited because I really feel that we have something a little bit different to offer. I'm not saying we're, you know, we're going to create a new genre where, you know, we're going to be the next PUBG and then uh, Fortnite's going to come out and blah, 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 blah. You know, like, I'm not saying that we're going to be like a, a huge thing, but I'm excited to, to, to show off something that hasn't been done before. It's something just, just a bit different than other games. 
Well, um, hopefully that works out for you. You know, it's like sometimes different um, is scary and alienating to players. You know? Yes. And that's we're trying to add that comfort level of it's still we, we use that, you know, that that old saying with it that it's, it's easy to get into, but it's hard to master. So right. the game itself, you can still get a pretty fun RPG experience without having to be the best PvP player out there or the best third person shooter out there. Okay. And uh, how long is the demo slated to go for? Oh, up until the actual demo itself? Up until the game releases. Well, I mean, like up yeah, until the actual game releases, yeah. I guess rephrasing that to how long is this, um, like, uh, streamer playtest thing supposed to last? Uh, it will go up until the, probably for the next month until we release the demo. Um, we've got a pretty good little tight-knit uh, group on our Discord, um, you know, that, that makes it pretty easy for us because they understand where we're at. Um, so the actual play, the actual uh, play... Excuse me. The play testing will be done over the course of this month, um, and I, I, you know, all you guys here are, are always more than free to, to, you know, you can always ask me for my Discord link, and you can come and check it out for sure. Um, but it's been, it's, it will, will be a month, as, and you know, again, I say that we all know how this works in the industry. I say a month, a year from now, you'll be asking the same question. So we'll see. <laughs> how long have we been yeah. waiting for Star Citizen? <laughs> Oh, it's so funny you said that. I was literally just Googling Star Citizen just a couple hours ago. Because I was like, huh, I wonder if it's ready to be played. Because I saw them do that, uh, what's it called, Area 18 or whatever, like the city planet. Um, and I was like, oh my god, that looks cool. I mean, yeah, the, uh, like, uh, let's just say we have friends who have been working on games for far longer than they anticipated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, That's a nice way of putting it. I'm like, <laughs> anyway, so after the demo, um, is the because I noticed on your website there seems to be a plan for a Kickstarter at some point. Yep. So, so like I was saying, I, uh, at the end of the demo, or sorry, the end of the play test, when we release the demo, we're going to be making a decision then if, um what our financial like what the financial plan is for the rest of the development originally the plan was to do a kickstarter um but now that we've had publishers reaching out and getting interested in it um some more prominent publishers as well uh the idea more is switching from why risk a crowdfund um when we could get direct support from publishers um, so we were going to do a Kickstarter. We were actually, I was planning on doing it last month, but after enough research and, and kind of figuring it out, my things like my email subscriber list wasn't big enough to guarantee success for the amount of money that I'll be asking for. Um, I don't have the, the network built up to have a successful crowd crowds, uh, funding. And, and the reason I say this is just, I've been a marketer for a long time myself and, um, I'm I'm very aware of, of you know the level of optimism the level of optimism you need. Also, you also have to have a level of realism with that. And I'm not going to go in and ask for a bunch of money when I'm you know 99.9 percent .9 confident I won't get it all. Um, and then with you know as we know with Kickstarter, it's all or nothing. You know, and that means I just you know a month of of hoping for this funding or or whatever and and needing it or depending on it and doesn't come through. And then then what? I'm in a bit of an interesting scenario because. You know, I'm on because I, I hurt myself at work. I'm on, um, you know, a, dis, a level of disability for my because of that. So, you know, but in a few months, when my rehab and everything is over, I've got to decide what I'm going to be doing. Whether it go back to like a normal job or continue on, like owning and running um, full time instead of part time. Um, so, the Kickstarter will really depend on what happens at the end of this play testing and when the demo is released, the amount of attention that we've garnered from the demo, because you know, you, you can waste a lot of time on a Kickstarter that isn't going anywhere. This is true. Um, you know, we, we featured Kickstarters on the program that, um, did just that. Like that was a depressing situation. Like, and it, it sucks. I've got a I've got a friend that you know on on Instagram that I've been you know right alongside her. She's been um, 
you know, she's been. Uh, I don't really want to say anything about that. <laughs> she might be listening. Uh, they launched a Kickstarter. I didn't want to tell her, like, I really don't think you guys are ready. Like, you, your team just came up with this idea for the game. You don't even have a prototype, let alone a character in the game. You just have uh, um, concept art. Um, I didn't want to tell her at the time, like, you know, you I, again, I come from a professional marketer. You really shouldn't. <laughs> like, you really shouldn't do it because you're going to get demotivated. Your team's going to get demotivated. You should do some promo work on the game first. Get find validate your idea first do people resonate with your idea do enough people resonate with your idea first um and you know she was so excited all all the time with the kickstarter and then when she started to realize that oh god we have two weeks left and we're not even a quarter of the way there all of a sudden her communication dropped off their post dropped off you know so there, there becomes a level of you know you get so optimistic and so dependent on it that whether it's a financial dependency or not, you, be, you kind of grow an emotional dependency on it because you're so you're so optimistic on, on getting that money. And it can be incredibly disheartening when you don't get it. Uh, no <laughs> doubt. No doubt. I'm like, you know, all sorts of things, especially if you're, you know, your project may not survive. Like, well, your company might not survive if it doesn't work out. So... Yeah, there's certainly a level of risk. I, I think that, you know something that I've learned from growing businesses and doing a lot of business consulting, and something that I take from that experience into this is you need to validate your idea. You can think you have the coolest game idea, the best game idea in the entire world, until enough people resonate with that, you haven't validated it, and you, it's still only in your mind the coolest idea ever ha to ever happen. Uh... I suppose that's one way of putting it. It it all depends, I think, on your intent. Because Sorry, I should have I should have prefaced that. Yeah, if you're looking for commercial success, right? Because we have had people on the program who aren't necessarily looking for that, or are building up to that, or uh, you know, we had a dev here not too long ago who just wanted to make a specific kind of game that they wanted to make, and you know, they did some extreme things to get there. Mind you, but they <laughs> again, yeah. I should, I should, I should doing it for it. the art is a nice gig if you can get it. Yeah, let me let me put it this way. Let me say that if you're looking to make, I should have maybe said it a bit better. If you're looking to make a business out of it, validate your idea first. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Um. Anyway, uh, getting a bit low on time here, so just a couple more questions from my end. Oh man, you guys had uh, the wrong guest if you're limited on time. <laughs> well, we, you know, we have another segment to get to, and we have another show after this. So, um, we do keep things to a certain level of time. If you have a lot more to talk about, maybe you can come back on sometime. Yeah, I would love to. I yeah, see, I see, corrupted is in your chat. Just give me, even if, oh, corrupted, I see you. I, I corrupted is that he actually works as he's leading to be a. We're going to call him a junior developer for us. Right. I mean, we might have you on the program when that, after that uh, demo comes live and all that stuff. You know. Yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to give it a shot with you guys. Good. Yeah. Um, but in the meantime, um, I believe you mentioned a few times before that you hooked up with Vox Pop, who we had on the program a few months ago. Um, what attracted you to that particular platform? Uh, they didn't. Vop, the actual platform itself didn't attract me. To be very flat honest, it, 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 I could have put it on itch. I could have put it on stream. What attracted me was the people behind it. Uh, Mark, Mark with Vox Pop has got to be one of the most genuine, supportive human beings I have met in my life. Uh, when I had less than like a hundred followers on Instagram, and I, I use Instagram as a reference because that's where I grew first, up to like five thousand followers, and moved over to, to Twit or Twitter, start building that up. You know, he he found me before anybody. You know, before anybody, I'm talking, I had nobody. And he just says, I know he was trying to grow, grow his platform as well. But the fact that he's like, here, let me take you under my wing and, and I'm going to help you. You know, and he, I go to him when I need marketing advice. Uh, you know, this guy's worked for, for, for some big game companies. You know, he knows his stuff. Um, he, he would support me and he would, I would run different marketing ideas past me that, you know, what do you think about this dancing vid? And he'd just be like, holy crap, man, that's going to be great. And he was right. Every time if I post something like that, it was right. 
he he loves the indie dev community. He he does things for the right reasons. You know, I know Vox Pop isn't like the most prestige, the biggest game platform out there yet. You know, what it's going to lead to is going to be great because you have some of the best people behind it, even just the community that they're building behind it. And as you can tell, I'm very passionate about talking about them because I think support is one of the greatest things you can give an artist. You might not be able to give them money. You might not be able to give them anything. But as a friend, as a family member, as a stranger, as anybody, support is the number one thing that you can give anybody trying to express their creativity, their soul. You know, being, being creative is a scary thing sometimes. And all it really takes is one person just kind of patting you on the back and be like, that was awesome. Great job. Or giving you real constructive criticism. So what attracted me to Vox Pop was they, they seemed excited and passionate to have someone like me that had no followers, no prototype, nothing ready to go. And they just wanted to help me in exchange for me just having my game on their store. Yeah. And, and and I would recommend and I've even seen them. I have gone to bat for them. I saw some guy on on Twitter being a dick. Uh, he literally was just being like, oh, look at all their paid lackey coming to defend them. And I was like, that's bullcrap, man. Like, that's you cannot act like that. First of all, this was an indie dev. And I was like, you're an indie dev, dude. You, you can't. Like, we're supposed to be a community and we're sticking together here. And you're calling out one of the biggest supporters of indie devs right now, calling us paid lackey because we're there to defend them. And it just annoyed me, you know. I, I just don't get it. And regardless of that, I, Vox Pop, is an an amazing community platform. If if you're a streamer, if you're, um, an indie developer, especially, they don't really care where your game is. They don't care if it's going to sell a million copies. They want to help you in exchange for selling. Just to put your game on their store. Yeah. And you can't you can't put a price tag on that level of support and that level of passion of wanting to help people. It doesn't come very often. Uh, duly noted, duly noted. I mean, you know, we had their CEO on, and he seems yeah, to be... Mark, yeah, that's Mark, yeah. Charles. Uh, like, Charles. Um, uh, oh, the CEO. Sorry, this is the COO. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think Mark, Mark was supposed to be there, but he had the thing to do, or the, something happened there, but... You know. He said some pretty um, rough goes with his with some stuff with his family and i'm not at you know it's yeah. not my place to say it but my heart has has gone out to mark you know i'll just say that yeah. you know so yeah so and you know there's just certainly doing interesting things um and hopefully it will pan out for them like um anyway uh right so i'll see if my colleagues here have any further questions for you i think i'm good uh I think I'm good, but it's been great talking with you, and I look forward to seeing more from your project. Oh, I think you appreciate that. Okay. No. All right. Um, so it looks like uh, that'll be it uh, for this runabout. Um, so, you know, uh, it certainly was good having you on the program and taking time out of your schedule and being with us here to talk about your game. Um, you know, we are, we'll keep an eye on it and see how it um, develops. And indeed, we might have you on the program to some point after the demo is released, you know, like pending actual scheduling, because that can always be a bit of a thorny thing. Oh, yeah, um, I understand depending. that. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, uh, anyway, uh, in the meantime, where can people go to uh, get the demo when, when it's released? Uh, the demo itself will be exclusively released on VoxPop, uh, so you'll need to have the uh, the VoxPop client and account on there to download it. Um, after that, uh, the main game itself will to be discussed. But for right now, the demo will be released, and you can figure out or uh, find out when we're doing that. Uh, our Twitter is Five Big Games, Instagram uh, web page is FiveBigGames dot com. So all pretty easy to find us. All right, um, so. Be sure to check their relevant social media for details and so on and so forth. Uh, Penny, play us in the next segment. All right, so welcome to the topic of discussion. 
Um, this week we are talking about Serious Sam. Um, oh you know, my. Lieu- <laughs> well, it's because um, we were trying, we've been trying to figure yeah, out. We're going to exactly talk wanted- about the Apple, Epic versus Apple thing, but we're waiting for the shoes to finish dropping. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, well, I mean, it's almost done. It's got a few more days, but you know, we still have Tim Cook to go through. And Tim Apple. <laughs> so we're talking about that next week. So this week we're talking about the Serious Sam franchise because I played a bit of Serious Sam two until I could stand it no more. I'm he like, doesn't have hands. They're just bombs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Like I'll be honest, from a personal standpoint, I've never been, be, I've never been able to really get into the Serious Sam games, and that's mainly because of their fucking design. You know, um, some people identify the Serious Sam games, at least the mainline Serious Sam games. There's a whole host of spinoffs, but uh, you know, you know the the one the I, the I have no that, head, I have no yeah. head yet. I scream anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you know the, the serious Sam FPSs. Those are what people consider to be the mainline game. Um, some people have called these old school shooters. Um, no, they're not. They're they're not um, in the sense of they're not Doom. They're not Quake. They're not any of that. Um, they like serious Sam was actually a brand new type of shooter. Um, and I don't think a lot of people recognize that at the time because, you know, the first game came out in 2001 and it was a bit of a, I won't say revelation, but, you know, it was a bit of a fresh air because in 2001, 90s FPS style was dying out, Half-Life influence and, you know, things were heading towards World War II town. Um, Return to Castle Wolfenstein came out. <laughs> yeah. Um, Utter, utterly revolutionized everything, added right. elements of realism, ragdoll physics, mm-hmm. much more efficient exploding body parts. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the uh, wakes. The, yeah. And the Medal of Honor series was uh, tracking on the uh, PlayStation, and it's like Battlefield. Yeah, Battlefield. Point is, this is the direction most FPS games were moving in 2001. And here you have this thing that is, you know, so different from what are the current trends. And, you know, that got identified as old school, you know, it's in the vein of Doom, Quake, and no, it's not. And I'll tell you why. It's because... um, the design of a Serious Sam game is very different than Doom or Quake or Duke Nukem or any one of those 90s FPSs you could name. And a lot of it has to do with the actual level design. Because the the the, uh, the actual level design of a Serious Sam game is about as linear as, say, Half-Life or any corridor shooter you could name. You know, it's not spindly with maze-like proportions like uh, your Doom levels are. No, it's a lot of tunnels to arenas. It's a horde shooter, um, for lack of a better term. Because, you know, what's the signature um, gameplay elements of a Serious Sam game? Overwhelming enemy forces. It's a, it's a gauntlet. <laughs> yep. It's, and, an absolute, you know, it's, it's an absolute gauntlet. It has more in common with, like, Far Cry. <laughs> Uh huh. Or painkiller. Um, you know, it's like you know, one of the memes around Serious Sam is you know the thing that you're doing is pressing S and holding down mouse one. Um, to translate that from FPS speak, that's moving backwards and firing. And yeah, you do a lot of that in a Serious Sam game. Like because... yeah, a lot of a lot of Overwatch players have a broken S key. <laughs> yeah. Um. And, you know, the, that's fine because um, the serious engine that was developed um, around these games was really made to showcase um, how many enemies you could cram into a 3D FPS. Because, you know, that was the big revelation of Serious Sam, first and sen- the second encounter. It's, you know, not so, you know, it's not impressive in its 
level design or anything, but you know, just the amount of enemies that you could have on screen, and not you know, in a three D uh, FPS was um, never seen before. Because like you know, this is where the Doom comparisons come from. Because you know, one of the hallmarks of your sprite based. 90s FPS is where you've got a lot of enemies. You got a lot. You can't get the arenas there, but they had to it doesn't. It doesn't take a lot of. Uh, doesn't take a whole lot of um, memory to have a uh, flat enemy sprite that always faces you at particular coordinates in an arena. Compared to lag, an I got lag and model. I got lag in Wolfenstein 3D. So that's that's not it. It's just right. the series Sam series is not visually that far removed from say quake 2 or mm-hmm. return to castle wolfenstein or any of its or any of its predecessors but in terms of uh just sheer overwhelming mobs it, it's like in in the previous ga- uh games mentioned like quake quake 2 doom and so on and so forth there you could actually engage in an element of stealth whereas mm-hmm. just fucking forget about it <laughs> with serious sam I mean, no. it, it it was a system killer, even though it wasn't that far removed from it. Like, like I mentioned Far, far Cry, you know, which is the progenitor of the entire Crytek engine system. Uh, and another reason that that was a system killer was because there was so goddamn many elements packed into the fucking screen. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so the it... Serious Sam games are just, you know... Guns, I mean, look at this, like this gameplay footage we're watching right here. We got this monster just rushing you left and right. Uh huh. And you know. it was further compounded because it was a very economical engine. Um, I don't know exactly the technical wizardry behind it, but um, another thing that uh, really set Serious Sam apart is it was a budget game that was really, really good. You know, like yep. the uh, the first and second encounter, they were released for twenty bucks each. You know, that was budget pricing in two thousand one. And you know, uh, usually I, when you... go, go ahead. ahead, I was just going to say the first time I heard about this game, I actually thought it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I did not think it was real until I actually physically saw a copy of the game and played it, and I was like, "What the hell am I even looking at here? This is amazing." Right. So, you know, it's, you know, it may not be the prettiest FPS series going, but it's always been um, very technically impressive in its um, displays, um, especially for the price. I mean, you know, that that Eastern European programming, it's no joke. You know, this is where the demo scene came from, you know, where, you, you know, you're maxing out your frames per second on Amigas. And shit like that. So, well, and what's interesting about Serious Sam is that it's it's another one of those games that brings back the 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 cyclical socio political discussions surrounding video games. Like we hadn't really had a serious conversation about about murder porn in video games since Rise of the Triad, <laughs> you know. Uh-huh. And then all of us, and then Serious Sam came out, and everybody said collectively said, "What the fuck." <laughs> Right, the guy with bomb hands and no head screaming. Ah! It, yeah, it's like what the hell. I mean, at least yeah, there's no shortage it, of ammo in the game. I mean, that is true, but sometimes you do have to make sure you pick up the ammo um, because you can run out. That has happened to me in serious Sam games. Um. But yeah, you know, just look at Petty here getting overwhelmed by the kamikazes and shit. Uh, I mean, this is Serious Sam in a nutshell. Like, and that, and that's another thing about Serious Sam games. They're big, but you know, it it wasn't about sprawling levels. It's about huge open canyons here. Just yep. you, where you could have a hundred enemies swarm you. Yeah, like, nowhere to hide. I think that was one of the slogans of the game. I wouldn't be surprised. Like, um, <laughs> but you're dead, Patty. And, <laughs> yeah, 
you know. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as far as its weapon selection goes, eh, very standard FPS stuff. Um, probably its signature weapons, the cannon. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, how, else, how else are you going to clear out an entire canyon of bomb hands? Mm -hmm. That guy but, had a particular um, name. I can't think of it off the top of my head. <laughs> um, well, the bomb heads, are, they're literally called kamikazes. Oh. Like, now, mind you, they are bomb hands in Serious Sam 1 and 3. They're bomb heads in Serious Sam 2. Um, ah. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons why Serious Sam 2 is the black sheep of the main lines, because um, Serious Sam changed the arts, um, uh, changed the... Just about... I won't say it changed everything, because uh, having just played some Serious Sam 2, the gameplay is fairly similar. There are differences, as in the enemies are less bullet spongy. Like, you can act, I won't say you can actually make forward progress there because, um, it's serious Sam and to 11. Like, they've got mid bosses there that are as big as serious Sam first encounter and second encounter end bosses. Um, <laughs> Plus, I feel, like, uh, you I feel can, like I need to play this again so that way I can hone my craft in Overwatch. <laughs> I mean, the games are usually going for cheap, so yeah. it's not you know they're, it's not hard to get. Uh, right. Like, like uh, you now, especially like yeah, the, go at him with know, the knife, Petty. Go at him with the knife. <laughs> no, why? <laughs> Yeah, well, that is I'm sure they won't have any side effects at all. What with their hands that explode when they like lose focus, <laughs> stab them yeah. in the hand. I mean, well, you I don't. Mean, okay, uh, Go on, and that moving is another, on. Yeah, well, what I'm trying to say is that is another thing about Serious Sam. It's not necessarily a brainless shooter, even though you know you got all the you know hordes coming at you, but there's a there's usually a preferred weapon against a preferred mob. You know, like you bring out the shotgun against the clear skeletons and stuff like that. You know, unless this, it's... Is a, this is a pre-regenerating health game, it looks like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think any of the Serious Sam games does um, regenerating health unless you're doing it on... <sighs> Like the easiest setting. I think the easiest one yeah, was it's, Taurus. It's, it's I was I was just asking because it's so ubiquitous now, and uh, the blood spatter that you get when you take damage does go away for a second, uh, and that's uh, in a lot of modern games. That's kind of the indication that you're wounded and how wounded you are. Mm -hmm. Right. Um. Like as far as I know, Serious Sam has never um had a dalliance with that. Though I will say I haven't played the newer games yet. Um, you know, I have Serious Sam 3. Serious Sam 4, I have not been hearing good things about. Um, but like the, the game has reviewed poorly, like, apparently, it's um, kind of a buggy mess. Um, and it's big touting feature, feature of like a hundred thousand enemies or whatever, or like. AI companions that it didn't really pan out as well as they had hoped. Like, and you might have noticed that Serious Sam 4, I think, released like in October, um, maybe August, at least sometime last year, and it kind of vanished. Granted, some of that is because of the uh, exclusivity deal that they took. Um, outside of Steam, Serious Sam 4 is a steady exclusive. <laughs> You know, insert your own joke. I there. guess that one platform that, uh, yeah, still technically exists. <laughs> I, I mean, clearly that was a deal that was signed under different circumstances. But you know, and I am, and I can, I can understand the thinking of Stadia on this because they would want a FPS to showcase um, what Stadia can do, and you know what Serious Sam games do. They do, you know, well on the whole, um, though they have been slipping. Like, Serious Sam 3 had problems, um, mainly because Serious Sam 3 is actually a repurposed modern military shooter that was just crowbarred into a Serious Sam game. So, you know, the actual game looks like a modern military shooter, 
which means it's very gray, very brown, a um, lot of repeat assets. So everything looks the same. It, it, you know, it's got some ironically janky... too serious to be Sam. And that's another thing. Like this might have been a reaction to Serious Sam Two because Serious Sam Two got a lot sillier and got a lot of the mid two thousands brand of humor. If you play it, oh god, it is very painfully two thousand four. So edgy and edgy and <laughs> you, you like, got like, to avoid the ball. <laughs> it, it, it's kind of hard to describe unless you uh, watched it or seen some of it. Uh, kind of because, live commentating to Teddy's play. Here. <laughs> this happens a lot with Teddy's playthroughs. Um, <laughs> yeah, see, I'm not good at FPSs, so normally he's free on these. But uh, if you're around, maybe less so. Yeah, it's like well, if you, he's playing an adventure or puzzle game, Dallas can commentate. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, I only do that when he needs help. It's not my fault that that's usually. <laughs> if it's a if it's a Gundam game, we're in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, but yeah, it's like serious, like anyway, but. From personal experience, I've only played like serious Sam games for a few hours because, yeah, the whole overwhelming, unrelenting, odd things just grated on my nerves so fucking quickly. Like, you know, and, you know, mentioned by um, certain internet reviewers, there comes a point in serious Sam game where normal people will just say, you know what, that's enough and put it down. Like, um, but yeah, it, you know, the series has its fans. Um, yeah. Also worth noting that it has had some exclusive console uh, versions that are pretty good in that um, Serious Sam The Next Encounter is something of a lost uh, Serious Sam uh, game that uh, might benefit from porting because it's stuck on the PlayStation 2 and GameCube. And like I said, you know, it's not as good as the PC versions, obviously, but, you know, for console shooters of that generation, they're pretty solid. There's Serious Sam Advance, which is a decent Game Boy Advanced FPS. Make of that what you will. Um, I you know, never played any FPSs on the Game Boy Advance. So... I, I don't think those words belong in the same sentence. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. I'm like, it's a complicated... It has trigger buttons, technically. Well, it's more a for the time. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the FPS games you got, you know, usually if they weren't like Medal of Honor Underground, like, or, but like, but, I Vance. mean, then again, they made a passable Zone of the Enders game for Game Boy Advance. So, what, who yeah. am I to talk? Yeah. Well, I mean, they're not really worth playing now, obviously. You know, like, no 3D game on the Game Boy Advance is, but, right. you know, just, like the sheer technical chutzpah that I'm developers just, had with that uh, system. I'm you still know, marveling at the fact that they tried to make uh, Wing Commander Prophecy for Game Boy Advance. Mm. I'm like, what? <laughs> How does that even uh, work it, without the FPS? <laughs> man, back the, to the, well, the, the well, FMV. Well, I mean, I mean, I'm not saying they did include. The, I'm not saying they did include the uh, FMV stuff for that. But I am saying that they released several episodes of various shows for the Game Boy fucking Advance for some fucking reason. <laughs> oh, they released Shrek 2 and Shark's Tale for that thing. They uh, got off. Let's watch these movies on my game. I mean, you could technically do it. It's I, like I, mean, I guess you could watch it while you were in the car if you wanted an even more guaranteed headache than usual. The best well, part I mean, was I saw I saw a review where they used a Game Boy Advance emulator to play Game Boy Advance movies. Well, once again, context. You know, the Game Boy Advance player came out in you know what two thousand four, before the iPhone, before like even the iPod Nano. Mm -hmm. Like so, you know, yeah, these things were popular for a hot second because. The Game Boy Play, uh, the Game Boy Advance was the closest thing to a media player kids had in the early to mid 2000s. You know, obviously an idea that wouldn't even work 
a few years later. Probably why there was no DS uh, video. <laughs> but uh, it was there. Not uh, much of one anyway. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, not like the Game Boy Advance video series was. It, was, it wasn't anyway. until those fabulous UMDs that came out on the PSP. Right. Anyway, um, and uh, Serious Sam has also had a lot of spin-off games of varying and dubious quality. Like, it's like really a excuse for crow team to establish you know to expand the brand v- uh, with uh, indie devs mm-hmm. you know? and a few of them were done to promote serious sam 3 and some were i have no idea why they exist <laughs> but you know the, the the fan bases i understand them do not like the spin-offs at all because they feel they dilute the brand or whatever like i really don't think those things are really damage um the serious sam games because you know they're small little micro things you know not re- they're not even like full on console or even like handheld quality spin off things uh anyway so um, the, the best and- way to take care of bomb hands petty is to make sure you headshot them <laughs> Eat a dick. I, I hope that's a joke because even I noticed that they don't have heads. <laughs> I'm like, uh, anyway. So, any other comments uh, on the Serious Sam franchise? It's real serious. Eddie's getting stoned. What the hell was that? Oh my god. Fucking <laughs> magic. <laughs> I ain't anyway, dead, am I? I'm noticing a trend here. A lot of these guys don't have heads. <laughs> I've lost track, but you've been dead a lot in this game. <laughs> I, mean, I live, bitch. A, that's kind of how a serious Sam game goes. You will die a lot. Like, anyway, um, so that'll about do it for serious Sam here, and that'll about do it for this installment of Franklin's Silicon. As mentioned beforehand, no Friday show this week. Um, be sure to, t- you know, we that is uh, currently scheduled for next week. Hopefully um, no other last-minute emergencies arise. But, you know, life being life, never be 100% sure. Um, anyway, um, on the Sunday reviews, we have reviews for Darkanoid, Siege of Avalon Anthology, Silicon Dream Cyberpunk Interrogation, and Adeptus Titanicus Dominus. Um, so be sure to tune in then for uh, those. And if you enjoyed what we did here tonight, be sure to subscribe, hit the bell you know, to get notified, and also be sure to join us for our uh, next show, Last news desk on the left, which is uh, happening in about uh, less than 15 minutes. So yes. until Twitch uh, TV uh, forward slash Mac Paladin, it'll be in the chat. <laughs> yeah. Um, so until then, I shall wish you good gaming.